Wicked. It's Carl here from Games Brains Head Bang Live, GBHBL.com. Pleased to bring you an interview with guitarist Luke Haroff and bassist Chris Van der Walt from South African Slam Death Bulldozer Band. Uh, I'm gonna, I've been trying to say this correctly, so correct me if I'm got it right. Volvodonia, yeah? No. Volvodonia, but close enough. <laughs> okay, yes. These guys, um, gents, how are you both doing? <laughs> Doing good, yeah. It's uh, been a crazy while just sitting at home and trying to reinvent life as a musician and as a, as a touring band. Uh, it's been great, but it's, it was its challenge. Yeah, we've had lots, lots of time during lockdown to sort of like knuckle down and write, start writing our new album and just work on stuff for the band in general. We've had like, I've had, I mean, I've been off work for like five months now, so I've had plenty of time every day to just sort of like go through the emails and do all the like the pesky admin shit that you don't really want to do but i'm so bored that i i just kind of do it to pass the time now really and obviously i'm in the uk you're in the uk we've got this we we both know how our situation is but the south african situation in regards to the worldwide wide pandemic um for you chris um has it massively affected where you are because to be honest i don't know much about how it's affected south africa Man, I hate this virus. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, as a as a South African, it's been pretty crazy. We went into lockdown, which has been subdivided into five stages. So at the end of March, uh, I actually moved into a new house in the in middle of March, like literally two down two days before this lockdown started. We weren't allowed to go into the streets without a permit. There was a curfew. They actually deployed like 80,000 military personnel uh, personnel across the country so that if you're in the street without your permit you get arrested or worse some there have been uh, situations of violence uh, and people actually dying because of the treatment from uh, essentially martial law mm. uh, so that that kind of got better all all the businesses closed um, no one was allowed uh, obviously as musicians you're not allowed to gig you're not allowed to to uh, gather with a, a set amount of people in place, nothing like that. It was like everything was closed. All the e-commerce, all the uh, everything, every every single thing was closed. That was about for three weeks for the first initial wave. So yeah. we kind of flat curve a little bit and then went into level four, which lightened up. But with all these restrictions in place, there's still no light at the end of the tunnel for a musician whatsoever or touring. Uh, whatsoever so it's it's kind of scary but it, it it shouldn't stop you and your plan should our our plan should kind of be in place for the day that if they say okay cool everything's good you guys can go then we have tours lined up we've got albums coming out we've been doing stuff like that so that's been the situation here in a sense is just like everyone has been pretty bad so south africa is like super bad i think it's one of the the harshest number things. five now yeah it's 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 climbed a lot so even if even though we did have these insane regulations and stuff like that uh, our numbers kind of disprove that whole method in a sense so we're number five in the world and we're a pretty small country which makes it kind small of small country uh, with a with a high poverty rate that's the the problem so the, I, I think with south africa there's lots of people in the townships that won't go get tested or can't go get tested so you can't really count for those numbers it's just probably highly likely even more than the numbers suggest and uh there's like a BRICS uh union or something like that which is like brazil russia india china and south africa and four of those countries are in the top five with america so i think a lot of these almost like third world s kind of countries are getting hit pretty bad uh it makes it kind of worrying um mm. but we do find solutions to kind of pass the time in positive ways essentially because we're all in the same boat and there's no water so you know we can't th throw so we might as well just patch the boat until I think the with, rain. South with south africans too you like you get so used to how the government does absolutely nothing you sort of just have to like work stuff out for yourself there anyway so you get used to it it's not like the electricity getting cut off and you not being able to make your dinner is any 
actual trouble because you're so used to it already. You can just go have a barbecue outside, like whatever. Yeah, that really is the thing. Like we get used to living like this and I don't think that's actually very normal. Like we get used to being afraid of walking in the street because we might get mugged. You know, uh, we get used to living without power because, uh, you know, the government stole the money and it's just something we have to deal with as South Africans. And that's essentially it. We're at a point, especially with this whole COVID-19 situation, where they had uh, 500 billion rand um, injected from the Chinese government to help prepare hospitals and for the last three months, which they didn't do. Uh, a lot of that money was stolen, just like classic governments do. And yeah, we're at capacity. No one's got money. There's no ambulances. It's it's a bit of a shit show at the moment. Um, but honestly, I know it's bad. Uh, I'm not going to be oblivious and ignorant. But I find sometimes to try and ignore it is a, is kind of a good thing. Um, I think if you stand around a dark cloud for too long, you're going to get wet from all the rain. So. Mm that's where having the music is very important in a time like this. I think uh, people that don't create something creatively, whether it be music, art, or something of some kind, you know, building something or something, you know, it's, it's, you need an album now. And I think for, for me and for the rest of the guys in Bolvedenia, being able to focus on writing the music and planning the tours that, that, might happen and we, we, we try to keep positive about that so yeah it's it's been a challenge but we keep our heads up high that's you got it at the end of the day you uh yeah it's incredibly puts things in perspective um for this side of the world uh be it america western world europe and so on and people bitching and moaning about having to wear a face mask in a shop when you compare that to the trials and tribulations that you are going through it is incredibly humbling to a degree and almost embarrassing as well to us to an even higher degree i think yeah I, I i see some of these people without face marks and i get it like it, it well I'd actually no you know what i don't get it if you can <laughs> do like your that. part just save it a little bit it's fine like in our country if you go out to a shop and you could potentially be arrested and get a very 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 hefty fine um if you don't wear a face mask and People are getting infected at such a right year that you just might as well do it, man. It's people, people here though, I've seen on the news, like it, it makes my blood boil reading like the comments and stuff. Cause they, they don't care. Like all the comments are just like, Oh, I'll just take the final or I just won't go out. And all the people that say that are these like 50 to 70 year olds that are like the exact kind of high risk people that yeah. are going to die from it. But then when, when they're saying stuff like that, you're like, Oh, well, no, no loss really then, is there? If you're not really willing to care about other people. Darwinism at its finest, bro. Exactly. <laughs> so can, you talked about the positivity then. So do you think you've talked a couple of, mentioned a few times that you have been busy during this period. Talk about those positives then that you can take out of being stuck at home for months on end and so on. Um, do you feel like, okay, well you, you've used this time well, I guess, in regards to the band. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I personally have got like I've upgraded my whole like home recording rig and stuff so I can like track stuff nicely at home for the band. And I've I've started a whole new like post black metal death heaven type band in this oh, yeah. just in this in this time. So like there, there's it's, uh, like I said to you before we started the interview, I've just had so much time for the last five months to do whatever. You might as well use it for something constructive, you know. Otherwise, it's a waste. Like if I had sat here for the last five months and done nothing. I'd be kicking myself right now, you know? Yeah, it's it's been good. Luke's also been pushing us a lot, which has been great, you know, getting us off our asses. I, I, I had a I got a daughter <laughs> the first of June, so it's been it's been good for me to just get my ass in gear and then and we've been writing really cool stuff now. We've got a good conceptual design of where the album should be going and, and the sound that we should be going for. Yeah, and, it's nothing and, like our last stuff. It's yeah, it's fresh. very interesting and it, it, like Luke says, it's fresh and it's moving forward and it's, we're pretty excited about that and, and exploring this kind of idea and sound as well. Um, and it, it's always just good to work on music and I think we've got, even though we're all in 
different rooms and most of these meetings happen via messenger calls or stuff like that. It's almost been one of the more collaborative uh, attempts in writing as a band because of this. Uh, everyone's got a little bit of time to just sit down and, and, and fiddle with the riff here, fiddle with the riff there and send it back and forth. And, and that's pretty, pretty cool, you know. Um, the, the little silver lining around this dark cloud, if you will. Absolutely. And, well, let's go back then a year. It's been just over a year since the release of Mob Justice. Um, it was a banger, one of 2019's most uh, brutal records, really. And at the time, I must say, it felt very game-changing, particularly um, in the last couple of years, I guess thanks to the internet more than anything else, become much more aware of the South African metal scene. And you kind of like seen it as quite a bright light within that scene, big and broken out of it almost, gone worldwide as well. So it kind of felt like quite a game out for you. Is that something you've now noticed a year later? I think personally, I think Mob Justice did well, but we didn't notice it as much as Psycho Sadistic Design, which is the previous album, because we toured this last album so much. Whereas before, like we would tour, but it wasn't as like full on as it is now. We would do like a tour every four months, every every couple of months, but like with Mob Justice. Like the guys, I'd had to miss like two or three tours just because of work. But they were touring like every every second month. They were like somewhere else. Like we, we did America, Europe twice, Australia, New Zealand. So I think because we were on the road a lot, we didn't really notice it as much, and didn't have the time to sit and like promote it as much as the previous album. Hmm. We well, still got. You still, I guess, within that, even though 2020 kind of made it fall apart, you're still in that period, I guess, where yeah. you're still promoting it, really. Definitely. Yeah, it was, I think... Carry on, it, sorry. It was just uh, promoted in a different way, I, I guess. Like you said, we were on the road a lot. But it also, when you're constantly on the road, you don't really get time to let it sink in as well. Yeah. You... you it's also like writing music. You can't get into that headspace. You're in the touring headspace. And then and that kind of that kind of fries your brain a little bit. But psycho sadistic design exploded. So yeah. uh, I think I think hopefully the new album would, would also have that kind of effect. And I think if we can find a good balance between how much we tour and how effective we can tour and how effective we can still market our album on, on a lot of ways and levels. That's essentially what we're going to be working towards. Uh, not that Mob Justice, uh, we did anything bad with it. It's just you can always do better, you know? Yeah. And I think also with, with, the, with this newest album, we've kind of developed the mindset of, like, with Mob Justice, like, it was obviously music completely that we wanted to make, but it was also made with a mindset of, okay, we want to make these people happy, but now we're sort of like, fuck it, let's just make whatever we want and whatever sounds good to us. If it's, if one song sounds a bit more deathcore than the other song, who cares? Like, mm. it gives the album some variation. It's not just, like, the same, like, four fret riffs for an hour long, you know? So I, love I think we're, we're sort of just like, we're not, we're not thinking too hard about it anymore. We're not like beating ourselves up about things or saying, oh, it has to sound like this. It has to sound like that. We're just sort of writing whatever sounds good to us. And I feel like yeah. that's a way better way to write albums. And like Chris said, we're a lot more collaborative now. Like with our previous albums, we would sort of have songs that we wrote that we would send to the other guys. They would edit a little bit, but like half the album would be songs that I wrote, half the album would be songs that Chris wrote. Whereas this album, it's you can't really say that song is a song I wrote because everyone's had a very equal part in like adding riffs and changing stuff, which is, I feel, a lot better than we've ever done it before. Yeah, and it's based a lot on intuition and feel. Uh, and I think that's important because then our flavor sound is going to come through a lot as well. And, and I think that's also why we're very excited about it. It's, it's almost going to be an album for us again, in a weird way. But in a good way, you know? It's not going to be like totally self-indulgent and, 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 and shit that, that we got. But definitely when we feel something feels great, we don't think about anyone else than what we like from the music. 
it's it, your enthusiasm for it is really coming through. It is clearly a very exciting subject to talk about. Obviously, still at early days as well to a certain degree. You're still within this um, sort of section of mob um, justice as well. And you talked about 2019 being such a busy year. I was looking back through your tours and your festival shows and all that. And we, I don't know if you, you, you doubt you remember, but we actually did a written interview with you back last year, just before you went to Australia as well. And it was, that was your first time in Australia. And it was like, I was then going deeper. And I was like, oh my God, you guys have got almost 100,000 likes on Facebook. As annoying as it is for that to be something <laughs> you have to count, that is incredible for a death metal band coming out of a South Africa. I, that was one that was one thing sorry to interrupt that was yeah. one thing um that like you say like with the likes that me and duncan like because the, the band basically started with it was i i was in a band before it was like a very basic death core band or whatever i was like 14 15 and we had sort of a couple couple arguments within the band and stuff and i decided to leave and then duncan was in a band and he also left his band around the same time and he sent me, I think it was a couple of the Crania and Ingested songs. So I was like, I'd never heard a slam in my life before that. And I was like, holy shit, dude. We, we need to do something like this. Like, think along the lines of sort of like an internet band, like Ingested, like Infant Annihilator, sorry. Um, but more slammy. So we, we started a, as like a two-man thing. And when we started the band, I did say to him, like, when we were in his room and he was recording the vocals for the EP, that we would be stoked if we got... 10,000 likes by 10 years time before we broke up. So seeing this kind of stuff is like unreal. But it's clear. They, they, they used to send each other voice notes with Duncan doing vocals over the phone. Over, over the guitar profiles, like to, to show me what the vocals are going to sound like. It was like really, he recorded the vocals for the first EP with like a broken overhead drum mic. It was like, <laughs> it was so ghetto. It was crazy. That's how you get the slam sound. <laughs> I've broken all my mic since. <laughs> we are one of the few bands that in this country who actually have something planned at the end of the year uh, for the UK and parts of Europe as well. A threat to send me on the road, hopefully, with Ingested, Vela Panath, and Bound in Fear. That's a pretty yeah. cool lineup, man. Yeah, we, we love the, the sort of mixed subgenre lineups. We found like the, the first one we did was we, we were lucky enough to go on tour with Despised Icon. And that tour was Despised Icon, Headlining, then Malevolence, Archbire, and us. And it was for all of us, it was so cool to every single night have like a different kind of band to watch. It made the tour not too boring, if you know what I mean. It wasn't like too samey every night. There was something different. It was like tech, hardcore, deathcore. And it made it so interesting. So ever since then, we've sort of pushed to do the, these kind of like mixed genre tours. So getting asked to do this tour by Ingested, who's a band that we've wanted to tour for, with for years, is like an honor. Like I, I always say, you know what's worse than a blues band at a blues festival? The next fucking blues band at the blues festival. <laughs> And that is like giving it a bit of variety not only entertains the bands because you're going to see this every night for the next three weeks but it also brings a wider audience together and some people that might have not been into a specific sound maybe likes one of the other bands that they maybe weren't into and it it really broadens the the audience for all the bands uh, essentially which is kind of cool absolutely cool. I can't see it like a mini festival. You go to a festival, there's 20 bands on one stage, and it's a varied thing. You might not be interested in them, but because they're only on for 20, 30 minutes, you often just stand there with your beer and watch them anyway, and then it's something you love. Same thing, really. And uh, exactly. you know um, the rest of the bands are on that bill well. Like, Have you ever toured with them, um, bands you listen to? Besides, uh, well, well, what he said. With, with Bound and Fear, we did a, a five date run on our one it was a headliner tour that we did i think two years ago now um and yeah they joined us for five dates they're great they i love all those guys they're, they're so <laughs> funny and they're so they're fun to tour with veil vale of nath i'm personally a big fan of because i i love black metal black metal is like my shit and they're like black and tech death so it's like it's it's two genres that i love and vance the guy who writes all their stuff he's brilliant uh ingested obviously is also one of the reasons we started yeah. a band in the first place. So all these bands are...
brilliant to tour with. I can't wait, personally. <laughs> it's also cool to be able to tour with bands that you really, really, really dig. Um, you know, like touring with yeah. Malevolent, like the guy said, or touring with Fit for an Autopsy or Arkspire. You know, that it just changes everything. Being able to see these bands night after night, just killing it. And, and you learn so much. There's like a lot of this that what we do it's not in a book you can't go watch it on a youtube channel and if you do you're lying to yourself you have to be on the road and you have to learn from people who are doing this day in and day out and that, that's where you essentially pick up the magic and, and the little tricks man it's stuff like how to duct tape whatever <laughs> you know like and the great. thing too with like touring with like your heroes like despised icon that was a band that I was listening to when I was like 13 years old and I heard a pig squeal and I was like, what the fuck is that? Like, I had no idea. And like, I mean, I never would have thought like what, eight years later I would have been touring with them. Like they're absolute legends in our eyes. They're inspired like all of us. And when you actually tour with them, you think these guys are actually just, they're just like us. They're just normal people, you know, like it sort of brings you down. And when they, you see that they don't have egos as well, like they're all, like all these people in bigger bands, like Malevolence, Archfire, Despise Icon, Fit for an Autopsy, they all are the mm -hmm. most humble people. Like it's in insane. Uh, you wouldn't actually believe how humble all these guys are. It makes you respect them like that much more too, I think. And it also inspires you to not be an asshole. Doesn't matter what you've achieved or what opportunities come your way, you, you're still human like everyone else and you can still have the time of day for, for other people, you know, and and that makes it cool and that makes it important and that makes it real. Yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate that even when growing up my whole life, I'd rather listen to someone that's a great person than some dickhead who can share the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, it's always great to hear that because uh, we put our heroes on pedestals, whether we mean to or not. And uh, any time you can come out and go, you know what, these people are decent, they're good people, they're nice, they're helping and stuff like that. It's much more comforting. I'm interested, right? And I know it's one of those things I guess that all band members do. Play down your own achievements. So you talked about size and you talk about heroes and all that. But do you not consider, do you ever take the moment and look at yourself and go, well, we're doing pretty bloody well for ourselves as well. And that these bands, as you say, some of the ones you've mentioned as well, and people you've collaborated with, you know, you already talk, you collaborate, talked about Malevance as well, but the likes of Black Dahlia Murder as well and things like that, that you are, you're part of that. You're part of that upper tier. What? I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that though. That's, it's, it's like, it's, it's, I, it's, I think it's, it's very weird to say like, like, yeah, we've collaborated with them, but I, I, I don't, I still don't think like those guys have had like years and years and years. And I still think we've got a long way to go before we're even like touching the, what they're doing. You know, like I, I would never say that we're anywhere near that level at the moment, but. Oh, no, I mean, yeah, because you know, no one are the artist, but someone like me who listens to your music and so on, I get to say it and I get to put you up there alongside that. <laughs> is it more of an, is it then, experience is it kind of like because of the time within the scene or the time you guys have been playing i think it's a little bit about that the, the time definitely does have a factor and also the achievements but also the respect that you gain from the the fans and the bands that you tour with uh, uh, over time you know i think it all adds up a little bit to it but it is like luke says it's a bit awkward to think that you're up there with these guys because they've been doing it for so long and they're really experienced and when we get to meet them we learn so much from them but it's it's an incredibly humbling fact that we've had some of these fantastic people sing on our albums and, and collaborate with us it's you know it's something we would never have thought of like having trevor sing on our album like what the actual fuck man or like you know like martin from gutalax we love gutalax you know or or Kevin from Suffocation, or Dickie Allen, or, you know, like, like what's happening? You know, yeah, also, like, also with like, it, it's, it's happened with like, like uh, it happened with a couple bands in the US and even in Europe, like bands that have opened for us are bands that I've listened to and I've come, come up to them and been like, you guys, I've been listening to you guys for years. And they're like, whoa, what, like, what do you mean? And I'm thinking, no, we should be opening for you guys. Like what, what's going on here sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that does freak us out sometimes. Sometimes, especially like on the Australian tour or like Luke says on the US tours, you get to some of these shows and it's like the fucking sickest band. 
And then we're headlining. It's like, how did that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> But you know, we just we, we, we do appreciate all the opportunities that we do get and we, we take them on with respect and, and pride and we work hard at it. We we don't take things for granted. Um, I guess it has a little bit to do with where we come from because we never would have imagined that this would happen. So we don't wanna let this this piece of gold let we don't wanna let it go, you know. We'll work hard at it to to keep this momentum going and, and to keep doing what we're doing because, like I said, it's unbelievable at this point. Yeah, like you don't hear of South African bands really much. Like I, I always search for, for like there, there's a couple bands like Rough Magic tours here, um, Wilderness King. They like they 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 they're, they're all in a band called Constellation now. They're on Season of Mist and they they do pretty well now overseas. And I always try to look for bands from SA that are doing well over here, and you can actually see are making waves. And there are a couple, but it's like you don't really see that many. But I, I also think bands there they, they it's more of like a hobby. It, it's harder to to actually like put your all into it because you know there's like not the scene that supports you really there compared to in Europe? It, it is a risk, essentially being a heavy uh, metal artist in South Africa. Very conservative uh, it, country as it is. So. Exactly. It's only been getting better the last while. Like, I started getting in metal bands, you would label say that it was all, like, we had to have a show, like a rock against religion kind of thing. A lot of bands. It was nuts. But, yeah, it's... Uh, I think people don't want to take that risk with some of the bands. It's it's a lot of money and stuff like that. But it is a step that you have to take. And once you've taken it, it's worth it at the end of the day. It's worth living with a little bit of risk because it does pay off. You know, like, as risky as it is, you know, this pandemic came and we're, we came and we're fucked. But the music will go through it. And we've got the deal side and we've got stuff on the horizon. And it keeps us going. And it's because we're taking those risks. It's because we believe that this can happen. It's not afraid of, oh my God, we'll lose everything. Because in life, you die. Yeah. You lose everything, whether you try or not. So, might as well try, you know. You saw uh, that glass ceiling that exists on that South African scene. Um, and it, well, basically you busted through it because obviously you are more of a worldwide band than than, than most. Um, as a person, like I said, is only really getting to know the South African scene in the last couple of years. And that's much thanks to certain PR agents who really pushed that side of music, um, pushed the music over there. That's really been like, oh my God, South Africa actually has a music scene. That does actually, a metal scene, it does actually. You know? yeah. yeah, I think that was one of the reasons also me and Duncan even started the band because I was, I was like, from when I was like 13, one of my friends, Greg, he showed me Chelsea Grin's EP and like, I was like 12 or 13. I was like, okay, holy shit, this is crazy. I'd never heard anything that heavy before. And ever since then, I'd, I'd been like searching so hard at shows in South Africa to see that. that sort of makes me feel the way listening to like those like OG deathcore bands made me feel. And there, there wasn't any bands there that made me feel that way. There wasn't anyone that had like ridiculously like heavy pig squeal bits and like breakdowns or slams or whatever. So I just thought, might as well start one then. If there's a hole in the market, you might as well. And that, that really is a thing. That is, I think that is one of the elements to do uh, why Volvadinia exploded is when Luke started writing those songs, it was the right sound at the right time. Yeah, and 2014. It was perfect. Yeah. Sound as well. yeah. And, uh, and everything fell into place. They did a lot of good work to create great awareness online, but it didn't stop there. It was the fact that the work in Volvadinia has always been very high. And it, it, it has kind of just created momentum. Now that's that's very admirable. Even I came into the band a bit later, and before I was even in the band, I was trying to steal what they were doing, and it's they were just working hard essentially. Like there was no secret sauce or you know like fucking black magic or, or yeah. anything like that. I mean, was... Duncan Duncan got accused of being a trust fund baby, and we all in the band, you know, <laughs> Duncan, Dun Duncan, out of anyone in the band, has been through the hardest times and I've never seen anyone pull themselves out of a shit situation like that guy has like so much respect for him like he was basically living in like a 
like the tiniest place you can imagine and he pulled himself out of that and now he's got a like a sick place and he's just just from working hard duncan has probably the best work be, sorry best worth work ethic i've ever met in a person in my life like he's it's it's insane like how, you would never crazy, think that you yeah. could make a life off of death metal but he's literally like proof that you can even you look yeah but i also make <laughs> people food for a living so so tell yeah, me but it is like Belvedere has been such an important part of in, in all of the members' lives um, through the years that it's it's saved a lot of us in, in many ways, and um, I think that's what makes it so important for us to succeed is that we respect what it kind of allowed us to be able to do. That's awesome, man! It really is awesome, particularly. Um... I guess there's almost, oh, not, not so much in these days, but a kind of side of, oh, it's just death metal and all death metal sounds the same. So why are you getting so personal about it? So the fact that you've got such detail and can say that, it is warming to hear, really. Death metal's all warm and fuzzy, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the UK side of the tour only, you play in some pretty great venues, including our local, The Underworld, which is in London. Uh, Camden, I London. I um, love the underworld. It's I was probably about to ask. one of my favorite venues in the world. I can't wait to play there. I, I had to miss the tours, like the, the last two tours in Europe, like I said. So I, I haven't played at the underworld, but I've seen a couple of bands there and I, it's a legendary venue. So it, yeah, it's, it's nuts. It's, it is going to be nuts. It's, it's also the fact that it's right in the heart of Camden. You know, um, as a touring band, it's actually one of the venues that you can just walk out of the venue and go check out a couple of cool things, you know, grab it. A There's cool, like good food cool. there, like shout out yeah. Temple of Satan. That place is amazing. Sponsor <laughs> and, us, please. <laughs> and we've really had some fantastic gigs there and an incredible response with, uh, with both the shows and merchandise support. And... A lot of South African fans also live in and around London and Camden Town, so they always pop in and, and try to speak Afrikaans with me, and it's kind of Barry. Cute. That's Barry. He's a legend. So that's yeah, I, I love it. Uh, <clears throat> London's got a, a lot of very well. The UK, not only London, um, like even Scotland, we played some cool shows. Um, we played some shows in. I don't even. It was the first one of those headlining tours, and it's like Bournemouth. Hey, Bournemouth, Bournemouth. maybe on the beach, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and it was so small, but like packed, and 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 people were beating the shit out of each other. I've never seen anything like it. That's the, the UK thing, though. Special. With Chris, with Chris joining the band, he obviously he's he's in a couple different like metal bands in South Africa, like one really cool new metal band called Borgasm. Check them out. But um. They're, they're, the crowds there are sort of like, you don't get the same kind of crowds here. There, they're like, they're very stuck in the 90s. And they just like circle pit and stuff. But here, it's like full on like beat down spin kicks and shit. And if you had to do that in South Africa, they would not know what's going on. They'd probably like try to start fighting you or something. But like, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very different crowd. So I was always thinking the first show Chris plays with us in Europe, he's going to be shocked. It was, it definitely was a crazy experience. I remember I was playing for like one of the top blues rock bands in the country at the time when I joined Val Virginia and they kind of overlapped and eventually I had to leave them just to focus on Val Virginia. But literally the week before we went on that tour, I was playing at a venue and a fight broke out and we had stopped the fight and it was, it was a shit show, you know? And then literally the first show I play with Val Virginia, it's only fight all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, cool. This is a, this is, this is the, this is the new world. And it was great. It was, it, I love it because it's, it's a way it's like how much the music makes them react in a sense. And they don't ever fight to destroy each other. Maybe in Philadelphia. <laughs> sure, <laughs> but, that was great. Yeah, body snatcher shows, no joke though. Yeah, but uh, but most of the time it's a camaraderie and and everyone works together and and it's a dance. It is slam dancing, really. So it is part and parcel of it, as you say. Most of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, I'd say it's it's all in good fun, helping yeah. each other. No one's trying to actually hurt or kill someone in most circumstances. 
There's a, I mean, there's if, if, if they do, we'll possible. tell them to piss off. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, it just I, I just when I saw it, it was the underworld. It was absolutely chuffed. Obviously, it's my local venue. I've probably seen I can't even count. I'm 36 now. I've been gigging since I was my teenager. The underworld has always been there. Um, it just I conjured up the image of the bands. Uh, all all the bands in the, from Majestic down to Bound and Fear are bands I'm familiar with, and it's like, oh, that's going to be. I'm getting old now. I might have to stand back for this one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I still I'm stand only, back. Yeah. I'm only 23, and I don't even. Can't be asked with that shit, man. <laughs> I'm the dad of the band. Yeah, let the kids do it now, innit? <laughs> Where do you guys feel you excel, though, or most? Do you think um, if someone really wants to get uh, the full experience, is it, okay, we excel best on record or see us live to really get that um, experience? I think live, well, definitely. Like, like, the way Chris... Thunderbolt, because we have two Chris's in the band, just putting that out there. The way he like screams at people in their faces and the way Duncan like swears at people and tells them to fuck everyone up. It's like, it's it's a very cool, even like being on stage with it, like listening to it, it's, it's quite cool to, to see how people like look up at Duncan and Duncan's eyes go like demon crazy when he does vocals. So like you can see them get encapsulated by like his his vibe at that moment. And it's, it's quite cool to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've always loved my like, studio. Great, and it's great capturing your mu music. Um, but every musician now, especially since they're not gigging, everyone can record at home, and it's great. But there are few things as fulfilling as playing a live show, and it's cool if you can play your show like the album. I have respect for bands that do that, and we do it pretty close, but we go a bit further you know we we do maybe sometimes have a break a bit longer or we we play with the songs a little bit to to kind of uh, adapt to be able to work with the crowd but it definitely psychs you up being there listening to all those songs so loud uh, both as an audience member and as, as a performer and even when you're in the studio playing your best you're you don't have that rush that adrenaline rush that you have going on to stage. So there's definitely a different headspace and a different uh, approach to live and studio for every band and especially for us. Our, stu our studio sessions are cool when we get full done, but live, I mean, that's where it's at. That's where the magic's at. That's where you get to meet the fans. I know it's COVID season now, but that's where you get to spit in their face and, and yeah, have all the good times and shit like and that. And I feel yeah. like I feel like with the live stuff, like we we'll change the songs up, like Chris said, a little bit to make them more personal live. So like we'll have like longer breaks where Duncan can get off the stage and run around in the crowd and hype people up, and just just like little stuff like that to make it more of a live experience rather than just okay, this is this is this song live and it's played exactly like how it is on the recording we want to make it like a more personal experience you know more real almost yeah definitely fantastic um so before we finish up then we're going to move away from the music side of things and i kind of want to gauge what your thought what what your fans of outside of music because you talk to bands and music tends to always pretty much dominate such a hefty part of it um we on the site we we cover two three major categories we've got gaming we've got horror and we've got the heavy metal rock side of things so it's the other two we like to kind of cage are either of you gamers yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. most of volvedinia tour with switches so we all have switches that we tour with and uh, duncan's addicted to animal crossing so we, <laughs> yeah i'm broke so i'm broke so i play xbox that's, yeah. Don't judge me. I play Xbox. It's it's whatever, but it's you know it's something. Lived on Xbox. Uh, Chris and I we we're on PlayStation consoles. So I, I love games. I grew up with games when games were fucking Asteroid and Pac Man. Man, I, I'm I'm your age, so you kind of know how far games have come in the last while. And I'm not gonna stop now. If you see the shit, if the shit that's coming out now is absolutely like the last Doom Eternal, that just blew me away. You know, the like, Last of Us Two looks amazing. It is, so, yeah. Oof. You know, and but realistically, music does take so much of our time. Um, I don't get. To, I still haven't finished Doom Eternal because I haven't had the time to sit down and play. 
And especially since I've had the kid now as well, it's literally, it's the baby and music and nothing yeah. else. I'm yeah, I usually just grind on Red Dead Online at the moment. I wake up at like half past six, play Red Dead Online, grind, do some bounty hunting missions and shit. That's awesome. That's the point, right? This is escapism. So, you, I don't know, maybe it's the idea like you get an hour free from the baby and music or you're not feeling particularly inspired. You go in that and I guess do you find yourselves like actually being taken away from real life like, and you're able to just lose an hour or two to it uh, yeah it's I great really i use my it. studio headphones sorry i use my studio headphones and just plug them into my controller and it's like a super surround sound like especially with red dead online which i play all the time you can hear where the bullets are coming from you can hear like if someone's creeping up or you on the right or left side it's like very immersive so it's it sort of like takes you away for a little bit fantastic mate that is it. That uh, it is for that form of escapism because if you only do music or only do life, it gets too much, and you need something outside of that. And gaming is a great platform for that. I mean, reading as well. I read a lot of sci-fi, uh, fantasy, and, and and odd shit like that. Uh, I dig horror art. I dig horror films. Obviously. There hasn't been a lot of cool shit in the last while, but every once in a while, something pops up like The Witch or something like that. Which is I don't do horror shit like par like I know I'm in death metal band and stuff, but paranormal shit if it's like about ghosts fucks me up. Um, like I, is it? I don't it, like it, it. I don't like it, it, dude. It just it's not right. Like you can have clowns and murderers and shit, but as soon as it's like paranormal, not for me, dude. I'll I'd rather like go sit in the other room or something. I'm such a pussy, it's crazy. <laughs> I'll admit it though, that's the thing. I'm not a, I'm not ashamed of it. Absolutely but I, not. <laughs> I think as a whole, the band definitely has a, a common ground in gaming. Um, we do like to play games, all of us, and we think about things as games. I think even when Chris tries to nail a guitar solo, he thinks he's pulling off high scores, you know? Even so, designs, like merch designs, based them off games and stuff. Like That's it. And, and horror films, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because it's silly, because it sounds like it almost goes hand in hand, as the expectation, as you already said yourself, is, oh, well, I'm in a slam death metal band, I must like extreme gore horror and yeah. the most horrible <laughs> shit out there. And it's like, I just like comedies, dude. Ones. I just like watch The Office and shit all the time. That's my <laughs> thing. Like, which office? UK <laughs> or US? US, US, oh, definitely. We are a bunch of goofballs. So, um, Eric Andre show as well. Eric Andre show is the best. That new. Uh, Jim Jeffries Intolerant is also fantastic. I watched it. I watched it two days ago. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's so good. We like being funny, you know, like we love being scary and horror. And uh, that's a big thing we take seriously with our music because, in a sense, it's like horror sound design or horror music design. You know, the way that a, a really good horror film makes you kind of cringe inside or give you these dark butterflies, if you will. Um, we try and achieve that with music sometimes. We, we want to make your guts feel twisted or your brain feel warped with music but when we get off stage we laugh and and, and also with our memes and stuff like we'll, we'll post all this crazy gory these like merch designs that i personally i wouldn't even wear they're like well okay that's a bit extreme but then we'll just post like these like funny ass memes that duncan makes and they'll like it, it's a good balance between like seriousness and then you know like joking around so the fans can feel more like connected like you know, they can laugh at that and be like, oh, I find that funny too. It's like common yeah. ground sort of thing. You yeah. think that's important to have that balance. Yeah, it makes you human beings and you're not playing characters. The band isn't a character and you're, you're doing a persona. Yeah, there's no yeah, gimmicks. You are. Right, guys, before we wrap up then, just quickly, uh, you've mentioned it a couple of times um, and I guess it's kind of like, I guess, is that the major plan then? Aside from the tour, obviously in December, fingers crossed everything works out and that does happen as it's supposed to. Um, what what's the sort of long term plan over the next I guess twelve months regarding the new album and stuff like that? Is it um, work away at it until it's ready? Well, we have so an, we have another thing in January. We've got a couple of shows with the Black Dahlia. But yeah. Chris, carry on. I was rudely interrupting yeah. there. I don't know if we can give out specific details, but there's like something happening really soon, like like something really cool happening really soon. I've been and waiting for since I was like fourteen. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely fucking nuts. So there's something really cool on the way in terms of uh, new music. So, but yeah, as I said, um, uh, 
that opens a lot of opportunities for us to be able to tour again, hopefully if the world gets back. So we've got the December tour in Europe. Uh, we've got those gigs with Black Dahlia in, in January and a couple of, we're trying to fill out some shows. But Lots then cool stuff in July. We, yeah, we got stuff in July and then uh, working on US stuff and working on, on Asian stuff. So And Australia. And Australia as well, connected with the Asian stuff. So there's a lot of stuff uh, ahead for us, which we're super excited about. And we hope they, they're able to happen with the world as it is today, but we're not going to let it stop us. Yep. Because when that floodgates open, you've got to have somewhere to go. And that's what we want to have. I feel like with you, the engine, is, the engine is revving up. You just wait for the green light, basically. And once that green light goes, you can go shooting off. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. This was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Thank you, man. It was Nick, great. My battery's got like 5% left, so I'm glad <laughs> I made it through load shedding. <laughs> thank you very much for watching. You can check us out on gbhbell.com as well as on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr. Go to Patreon to help us out over there. That's patreon.com forward slash gbhbl as well as Big Cartel where you can find some of our merchandise. We have a podcast running on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. And of course, if you like this video, do us a favor, hit the subscribe button and help the channel grow. Games, horror and heavy metal, what else is life for?